it's time for benediction time. <laughs> Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Wow. Thank you, Covenant, for welcoming me here. Thank you for the beautiful music, that beautiful transition out of the text into this time of reflection. As Danny shared, I had uh, the privilege to uh, shepherd her in her youth, and um, I remember distinctly, that, well, there's a lot I don't remember distinctly, and that's probably good, <laughs> probably for all of us. But it was our tradition um, during that time at Columbine United Church that um, our youth went on mission trips, and as a part of our bringing back to the congregation as a, a way of saying thank you and um, a way of helping our youth uh, really communicate and solidify what happens on that mission experience. Our youth came back and prepared worship for the Sunday after we came back. Most of the time, um, it was a blur for me because, oh, those are, those are a lot of work. Those trips, those weeks, I was hoping that the youth would show up. I was hoping that they would not wear shorts that were too short for uh, the folks in the congregation. Thank you. Um, and that we would we would be able to get through and at least share a portion of what had happened during that trip. I do remember distinctly when Danny shared, and it was her turn to preach. And I remember reflecting in that moment um, very clearly about my sense of call for her and uh, wondering when she would also hear that sense of call. And Danny, you have heard that and you have risen to that in a way that is beautiful. And so um, this church, this congregation, I believe is so blessed to have your voice here. I know I have been blessed by what you have brought. So um, in all of those fuzzy memories, that one stands out with you. And I appreciate you so much. As we look at this text this morning, I'd like to also reflect. Danny shared that we had an opportunity to have coffee this past week, which is delightful. It is also nice to connect um, and have a, an opportunity to reflect. It made me think of when I had first come to um, the Metro Denver area as a new pastor um, with a baby on my lap uh, as well. That baby is now over here and not quite um, a baby anymore. But um, 25 years ago, um, coming and interviewing for my position. I was uh, just kind of up the road here at Calvary Baptist at Hampton in Monaco. I served <coughs> for about 10 years. Um, and um, in the interview process, um, that was, um, it was pretty wild. It was pretty fruitful for all. So it was me standing before a gathered group like this with just rapid fire questions. And so I had a great opportunity to answer theological questions, kind of church practice questions. Um, there was one about the Broncos, which I was really <laughs> pleased that I could answer because I was coming from the Detroit area. I did not have the orange crush. I was like, yeah, I got that one. Um, and then came the question that I struggled with. And the question was, so what books are you reading? And I thought, oh, uh, they are not going to want to hear about uh, what to expect in the first years of life or um, all of the things that I try to read. Um, Boats, that was Josh's favorite book at the time. It was a rhyming book, had about six pages. Um, it seemed to work in the stupor of night. But it, it um, exposed me as a new mom, as a person who had gone through a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and was in a stage of life where if I could read three words at one time without a child um, crying or something interrupting, I felt like I had completed um, more in peace. I felt like I had done all that. Had. And so that question, I remember thinking, oh, they're gonna, they want me to have a really um, scholarly text that I'm reading. <laughs> Sorry, that will be for another day. <laughs> that day has come. <laughs> it, was, um, it was a realization as I was um, thinking through the parallels of my uh, 1999 life and Danny's 2024 life um, and where those things are. I want to offer to you, um, as a launch into our, our reflection today, 
some words from a text that I am actually reading uh, and um, celebrate that one life stage with you, but then also um, a perspective. There's a, a current book out that's called The Anxious Generation, and the author is reflecting on the impact of social media and technology on our young people. If you happen to know a young person or love a young person or have a, a smartphone or social media platform or are just curious about new research and new areas, I would encourage you to at least engage in the text. Sometimes when we read books, we, it's good to have a healthy um, a dialogue with that author, maybe it's only in your head. But in, um, in reading this text, the author uh, poses um, an observation about current uh, childhood practice and conflict management. And part of his, I won't spoil the whole book for you, but part of his hypothesis is that in the world of um, play that we have removed from children right now and replaced with rules, we are eliminating an opportunity for children to solve conflict on their own. And he references a, uh, a playground uh, that has rules, stated rules for all things, including what to do if there's a conflict on a playground. Now, we've all um, at least experienced it. I can tell maybe just even by looking at all of you, that you have never participated in a conflict <laughs> on a playground. <laughs> do I have that right? Yeah. I think I have that right. Well, you might have seen it or heard about it on somebody else's <coughs> playground. Um, but anyway, at this playground, the rules were clear. Any conflict needed to be resolved in one way and one way only. Rock, paper, scissors. Oh. Rock, paper, scissors. Oh. There are worse ways of resolving a playground conflict. That's true. But it made me really pause to think about what are the implications of having only one solution for resolving a conflict on a playground. First of all, um, it's not very nuanced, is it? There, there could be other ways of resolving a conflict. In addition, it puts uh, children in a physical pose with their fists. Right? Rock, paper, scissors causes kids to stand and square off face to face, fist to fist. Now the rules are clear, and there's not usually a whole lot of squabbling. We know which, which um, rock covers, uh, rock breaks or scissors and paper covers rock. We, we know those rules are pretty straightforward. But it, it causes a head-to-head -head, um, showdown. So it feels a little wild westy to me. Um, and I wonder, is there another way of resolving conflict? This text brings us to at least a few other ways of resolving conflicts and entering into healthy relationships with each other. It's a long text. You heard all, all of that text. Um, it was. We don't know exactly who wrote this letter, uh, but we do believe it was likely the same author of the Gospel of John. And we believe that this letter was really a written sermon to the early church who was struggling. Uh, imagine that, a church who was struggling, struggling to figure out what it meant. What's their identity? Who are they? Who are they in relationship to God, to Christ? Who are they? Um, in relationship to each other? Who are they in terms of understanding what it means? Like, who, what is their identity? And then what is their charge? And so this early letter frames that context. So it does offer a different way. I suppose the letter could be very quick if the resolution was rock, paper, scissors. It feels like it's as old as maybe that letter, that game. But it, it isn't, and there is something different than just a challenge. And that is remembering our identity and 
and then living out the command, the charge. So as I read and saw, I even got lost in the text in so long. We heard a lot about love. We heard a lot about um, our understanding of where God is. And it's easy to skip through the very first word in the text and miss the anchor. <clears throat> the anchor for this text is really the, uh, the time for us to understand our identity. And that's beloved. The author speaks to the church and gives them an identity and calls them beloved, loved by God. When we are anchored into our identity as beloved, as loved by God, it shapes who we are. There are times when we are very confident in that identity, but moment by moment, the world calls us by different names and calls us to reflect and question our identity also. Not just as a collective congregation, but as individuals as believers. I don't know the last time perhaps you were called beloved by someone in your life. Perhaps Valentine's Day on a card with glitter on it. Maybe you have a family member who uses that as a regular term of endearment. But most of us in our day in and day in lives are not greeting one another and calling each other beloved. Child of God, loved by God, is not how we often greet one another. But the author uses that word a couple of times in this text in intention to remind that early church, and I would offer us to remind this church, our church today, that we are in fact loved by God first. That is our identity. That is who we are foundationally. At our DNA cellular level, we are loved by God. We are created in love. That love is breathed into us first. We have not earned it. We did not um, we did not earn it as a prize. It is not given to us because um, we have a gold cross around our neck or we know every word to every Amy Grant song ever. <laughs> Bonus points if you've gone to a concert. It is not for that. It is not because we have memorized our scripture verses or we are here on a Sunday morning and started on the golf course or wherever else. It is not because of the size of our offering. It is not because of any other pious act that we have done to demonstrate to the world that we are loved by God. It came before that. That love came before those things. It doesn't mean that those are bad things. It doesn't mean that it's bad to be here or to know any grant song. That doesn't mean I'm bad. But that love was from God. Think of it that way. First, our identity. And then this text moves through and reminds us multiple times of our connection. And then there's a sweep out of what to do about this. Because we are loved, we are not just to dwell and feel really great that we are loved and feel really special. That's nice. But we are called to act. We are called to move. So it is more than a vertical. It is also a horizontal. A horizontal call. And that's in relationship to how we treat each other, our brothers and sisters. And that's where it gets really tricky. You might know someone or might be someone who says, you know, I, 
the Bible is really, there's a lot that's probably really good in there, but if it would just tell me, like, what to do, <laughs> then I'd be all right. There's just a lot in there. And if you just, you know, get to the point, tell me later, what do I need to do? There's a lot of stories, a lot of names I can't pronounce, places I don't understand. Just get to it. This text, probably more than any other, does that. It tells us who we are and then what to do about it. And then we just want to keep reading because we would prefer maybe a different reaction. <laughs> maybe it's the interpretation. Maybe something's lost in translation. But actually, it's very clear. Because God has loved us, we are to love one another. And in this case, the word for love is to have care and concern about the welfare of others. Care and concern. The welfare of others. That is what to do with this love that God has given us. It doesn't say, until somebody is mean to you. It doesn't say, until... They, um, they are no longer kind. It doesn't say only if you like them. <laughs> only if you vote the same way. Only if your zip code is the same. Only if you went to the same college. Only if they went to college. That's not what the text says. Because it's really that broad. It's really about loving with a generous spirit. Now I'm going to really flex, Danny. I read two books. Not just one book, but two books. There's another book called Unreasonable Hospitality. And in that book, there's a, a great line that I think is really um, connecting here. And that's that service is black and white, but hospitality brings the color. Right? So when you think about this, it's bringing the color. It's going beyond the expected. It's going beyond what is just quid pro quo. You do this for me, I'll do this for you, we're all good, right? No. No. And sometimes you don't even get anything back. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Does that mean there's a God? Does that mean you did it wrong? No. Does it mean that you said the wrong words in your prayer? No. Our charge is to love one another. Simple, right? <laughs> Until you're at Thanksgiving dinner. Again, or driving every single day, oh, yeah. or that one person who comes and says that one thing. Or all those people who all say the wrong things. Whatever it is for you. When we think about our identity, we love it. You are loved by God. That love has come before you. And honestly, that love will come after you. You have a choice. That love will be there. But then to move forward and accept the call is greater. Is adding color and going beyond what's expected. I don't know exactly what that is for Covenant. I'm your guest today, so I'll pose it as a question. Sounds like you all are doing a lot of moving and changing and exploring and thinking and entering into some ways of being that are new. So you probably have far more specific ideas than I could even tell you. So what does it mean to be beloved as individuals and as a congregation? 
can't call ourselves the early church anymore and get away with it. But we are the church. And what does it mean to fully embrace that truth? To love one another. To love our brothers and sisters. And step out. And reach out in action. And find where there is no fear, because we are not on the defensive. We are here to reflect God's beauty. Our pose is like this, because we are lifting up and sharing it. We are giving a high five. We are offering a hand up. We are hugging. We are cheering. We are not posing, hiding it. What would the world look like? And that's what we taught our children. If those were the rules on the playground, what would it look like if we were ready to change the world? Are you ready to find that out? I encourage you. And accept the challenge ahead of all of us, one step at a time. Not just taking one day at a time, but honestly, the moment. Oh God, sometimes we wish that the challenge ahead of us felt just a little easier. But the truth is that sometimes it feels overwhelming and it feels really big and complicated. And then there are ways that your words cut to the simple. Remind us in small ways and in big ways, in constant, gentle breezes and in big gusts wind, that your spirit is here in this place and in every place. For in that reconciliation of relationship and in building connection, we embody you. We bring your love to life. We are loved by you and we love you. As your people gathered here in this place, we say thank you. Amen. For those able.